Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our panel. So on my far right, we have Danny Deal. She is the head of communications and creator insights at Band Lab. Uh, to her left, go ahead, round of applause. <laughs> to her left, we have Nadir Contractor, SVP Digital Strategy and Biz Dev for Universal Music Group. To his, <laughs> to his left, we have Sam Kling, Emba 2009, by the way, Chief Creative Officer at CSAC. Hi, Sam. Hi. And to my right is Vicki Nauman, Founder CEO of Cross Border Works, a boutique advisory firm specializing in music licensing. Hi, Vicki. <laughs> Yay, we have slides. Amazing. So we're going to dive right in. This is the future of music in 40 minutes, so buckle up. So the above graphic, you've probably seen it if you're interested in the music business. This is the global music business for the past 24 years. It clearly shows the growing dominance of streaming, duh. But streaming itself has been recently disrupted. Of course, we all know Spotify, Apple, YouTube, Amazon. But there's a new kid on the block. And that kid has hit a growth spurt. <laughs> and that kid is really popular, really quickly. TikTok. And before we all say, oh, TikTok's not a DSP, isn't it though? Considering it launched a distribution platform last year, Sound On, filed a trademark in the United States for TikTok music eight months ago, and already operates a DSP called Reso in India, Indonesia, and Brazil, like it or not, TikTok is a DSP on steroids. That trademark filing listed use cases far beyond our current streaming paradigm, including live streaming audio and video, allowing users to comment on songs and albums, as well as upload their own photos for playlist covers. When you talk about innovation in the music business, there's arguably no other company exerting as much innovative pressure as TikTok. This innovation is rapidly transforming the listener experience, but also the creator experience. We are seeing shorter songs charting, sped up songs charting, often cataloged from years ago, and more one hit wonders than ever before. Even if it were to disappear in the United States tomorrow, TikTok has forever changed music. So let's talk about it. The short form social video phenomenon in general. Who wins? Who loses? And in the next three to five years, what does TikTok reels, shorts, et cetera, do to this graphic? Does it grow our pie? Does it shrink it? We're going to start from a licensing perspective. So I'm going to hand it to you, Vicky, first, and then we'll go to Nadir after that. Yeah, it's, it's a great question because one of, one of the things that happens in music is companies will burst onto the scene. And sometimes there's ambiguity about what are those rights. And, you know, is this protected as a platform under a, you know, safe harbor, which is part of copyright law under section uh, 12 here that protects the platform while users are uploading? Or is it something that needs licenses from publishers and labels in advance of the platform going live? Um, and, and there's, you know, technology is moving at a much faster pace than any of anyone in the industry can keep up with. And so there's a, just a constant push and pull of new tech emerging, new use cases. And with TikTok, you know, they started out, it was originally a company called Musical.ly that was sharing clips and then it evolved and got acquired and there were, you know, there were there were some settlements and some issues along the way. But I think that it's now at the point where there's a lot of pe there are a lot of people in the industry who are looking at it and saying it's so dominant and it it is feeding additional listening and additional streams into DSPs, but what is the value I I that it's contributing back to the industry? The direct financial value and you know the industry starts to get impatient with companies and wants once they've achieved some level of success 
wants them to have more skin in the game financially. And I think we're at that point of, you know, where is TikTok's value? If you, I think it's hard to argue that it's just a promotional platform. Um, now it is something there where there's actual, there's actual consumption being happen, being um, you know, being made inside of the TikTok platform, um, and I would imagine over the next couple of years we're going to see a change in yeah, morph into that DSP. Exactly, exactly, and you know, and it is a destination. And I also think from a from a strategic standpoint, if I were TikTok, I would think, well, why why would I want to just send all of this? uplift on listening to other third parties? Why wouldn't I want to retain those users inside of my own platform and give them full length songs and different ways to interact with the music? Nadir? Yeah, I, I think to kind of build on what Vicky is saying. So, so first of all, we don't quite consider TikTok as a DSP, though I accept your points that, you know, they're morphing. I think that's a great thing to talk about. Everyone's morphing, right? They're evolving forward. I mean, first of all, let me make some distinctions here. TikTok um, is licensed with clips. It is not licensed with full tracks. Um, and then the consumer behavior on TikTok is fundamentally expression, not consumption. There is obviously some consumption, right? But it, it was created for expression, right? And that's true of all the kind of social um, um, category. So we, we come up with this name for it, I would call it non-DSP streaming. Um, right, so I was trying to, like, where in that it's it's it's, a, it's, in, it's, it's in that streaming? number, yeah, they, they merge okay. it in. So non, like, is it sync, is non, it streaming, non, what is it? Non-DSP streaming is, the, is what we've called it, right? Okay. Um, so the, I, think, I think it is different, and, and you know, you mentioned Rezo. Um, the, the reason that ByteDance launched Rezo was because they wanted to be in the DSP business and put their toe in it, and it's, you know, they've been in a few markets. Um, I, I don't know if you've played with Rezo. It's, it's, you know, it's a highly differentiated DSP. It's very popular with Gen Z in those markets. Um, and there's short-form yeah, like video Yeah, there's short-form video. Kind of like Spotify but, recently. Um, kind of like that, maybe. Hmm. Who knows? Um, it, there's short form video on there, which is clearly Bike Dance's core strength, um, and then um, and then you know track full full length tracks as well, which have been licensed. So, you know, it's yeah, it's it's a kind of an evolution of that, and they've taken the best of both worlds to to do that. Do we think it's adding to our pie in the in the so it's near a, it's to a, medium it's term? A, it's it's a good question, right? I mean, you know, all. Short YouTube Shorts, which is relatively new, Reels, Instagram, TikTok, they've, they've all generally sat more within our marketing divisions, and they've used that to try and drive you know, awareness of artists, et cetera. Um, fr from that perspective, it's a compliment, right? Um, you know, how accurately does it um, grow streaming is, is hard to tell. I you know, think it's kind of, a, a little bit of a lottery ticket for, for, for many artists. Mm -hmm. I think also the other thing with TikTok is, if we think about it as, as a marketing platform, it's, it's very different to what's come in the past, right? In that so social, social platforms were about following things that you were interested in. Whereas TikTok has you know, gone from like a social graph to a content graph. So you have this incredible algorithm that's providing you with content that's based on what it thinks is your interest. And I think it's actually pretty accurate, right, in, in doing that. So one, one of the problems from a marketing perspective is the ability that existed in social media, you know, five years ago was the ability to aggregate audiences. That's kind of gone away, right? So, so. so now you aggregate an audience around a piece of content, but you don't necessarily aggregate it around an artist, right. right? And that's one of the things that, you know, we need to catch up on in terms of like developing a better playbook to be able to do that. We're, that's we're, right. we're, we're, we're doing that anyway. Yeah, I've been right? reading a lot lately that it's, it's driving it to be more of a songs business <coughs> and moving away from an artist business. Tracks, yeah, sounds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Your company happens to employ a guy by the name of Brian Sutnick who's a head of marketing, I believe, or in, at this point, and I think he oversees your digital marketing as well. And I was 
working with him, and I want to say it was 1998, 1999, when he and I, along, uh, he was an employee then at a unknown label now called um, Palm Pictures. It was Chris Blackwell's second iteration of Island Records, and Brian and I turned the Napster funnel upside down to try to make it a marketing platform. And you guys at Universal are probably the best in the business at doing that. So well, going think, back to think, your question I about... Bri I think Brian is. Yeah. Brian, yeah, yeah. well... Yeah, he's, he's a bit of a dome. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the answer to your, or my feeling about your question um, is that it's not necessarily a great mechanism for songwriters and artists, because to your point, it's a lottery ticket, but for recorded music, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I, I also feel like so many companies have tried to do mo social music and most have failed. You know, remember years ago when Facebook allowed everyone, when you were listening to a DSP and if you integrated your Spotify, that it would display everything that you were listening. It was actually, it was an antisocial <laughs> experiment because then everyone was My like. MySpace even, yeah. But it was like. What, you listen to them? Oh my God, well, how <laughs> we have nothing in common. I thought we were friends. How could this possibly be? And so there's a tribalism around music. And in, in, in a social world, um, I think that TikTok has been able to capture something around the social aspects of music by, by these clips and, and surfacing people's expressions using the music. And it has really made an impact. But I feel like um, I feel like it's just it's it's just the tip of the iceberg on where I think social social behavior and music could go in digital because of the tribalism and we just haven't ever really been able to truly capture all of that. Oh my gosh, this this could not be a better segue into our next <laughs> question, um, which is very much about uh, fan tribalism and and that kind of consumption slash participant behavior. So let's dig into it. We're gonna continue along this theme of streaming disruption. Let's talk about the sheer volume of new music that's brought to market on a daily basis. So the industry standard conversation says it's 100,000 new songs a day. They're uploaded to DSPs cumulatively. And probably that number's actually probably higher when you take into account BandLab and SoundCloud and other platforms that allow for direct downloads without an ISRC. Um, that number's growing with no end in sight. So like the barriers to entry are non-existent. Uh, streaming platforms now service literally every music niche possible. And media research forecasts the number of people paying for music creation software and skills learning will grow from 30 million last year to almost 100 million by the end of this decade. So a lot of people want to make music too. Let's consider this tweet. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? This is a recent tweet just this January by music manager Sam Moreland of Artist publishing group, who I hope is here. He was invited. Shout out, Sam. This is his tweet. I've said this before, but most fans are becoming artists themselves. Fans are now participants, just like in sports. Majority of football fans grew up playing the game in Little League and Pop Warner. Most of these artists will make music for a couple years, quit, and then tell stories about it one day. So in a store with like infinite shelf space, right, an infinite stock, how can suppliers, artists, <laughs> compete and innovate? Where do we see opportunities for monetization? How can we you know, eat <laughs> in a world where fans are participants or co-creators? And as someone working at literally the forefront of this, Danny, we'll start with you. Yeah, so at BandLab, we do consider ourselves a social music platform. Um, one dynamic that we've seen happen over the past several years, which is really interesting, is that people want to participate in the process of making music. And so platforms like BandLab or TikTok even are able to capture the parasocial aspect of music that folks get from going to see a concert live or connecting um, over a band that they both like or dislike. <laughs> Vicky? Karaoke. Um, karaoke. Yeah. And now music creation has become a parasocial element. 
Um, so we're seeing this in the form of uh, forking, for example, on BandLab, which is when people can make their stems accessible for other creators so they can remix them. Uh, people can collaborate. Um, and we're seeing people want to engage in music that necess don't necessarily have the ambition of wanting to become a Taylor Swift. It is now becoming something that you can casually engage in. Do with we your have friends. Yeah. Do with your friends. We're seeing the rise of the casual creator for the first time in music, which we've seen historically in other forms of creativity, but not in music. We saw it with photography. Very notorious example to say that Instagram revolutionized photography. TikTok arguably revolutionized video and editing. And now we are on the cusp of seeing that finally happen for music. The next generation really wants to lean into the experience of music and not just be a passive recipient, but they want to actually engage and participate. They want to remix. They want to be the person that made that sped up edit. They want to be a part of the process. Yeah, I, I, this, is a, this is something, a topic that just absolutely fascinates me. I think about this all the time. And I then, I, you know, then the adult in me always gets to, but how do you make money? You know, how do you make money, first of all, as an artist? Like, where's, where's the money in just being a creator? And then also just from a, putting on an MBA hat or a business hat, you know, who wins here? So if you think of it, it if you use that sports analogy, it's, you know, it's the people that make the football helmets that win, right? Because now everybody's playing football. So, like, who are, who are those people? I guess it is... I guess it is a lot of the exhibitors at NAM, you know, right now that, that win because it's those are the create the creation software, and then um, let's definitely dig into who we who we think or how we think like an artist can win here. Like, what's I to me, it's like it's the I community. Will, I think there are more community. opportunities than ever for artists to win right now. Okay, and I also think that we're at a a very special time where incoming tech is actually really well poised and the labels are really well poised to work with each other in a way that was never possible 10 or 20 years ago. I think there's a path forward with the incumbents and the, the newbies to actually create a more holistic experience that benefits creators and artists in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, I think that we really need to work with the system in order to create systemic change. Can I just add a, add, add a point, yeah. So, so um, you know, this 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 very big number, this hundred thousand tracks a day, uh, has obviously been in the narrative and ether for for a while. Um, in fact, I think Daniel Ek stated this in the summer of twenty one or twenty two. I can't remember. Um, and and that sort of has become the kind of soundbite. I think mean, one of the things that happened, I think it was late last year or early this year, was Luminate, who you know measured the charts in the U.S amongst other things, they, they actually did a study where they analyzed 80 million tracks. And I think it was a global study, it might have been a US one, probably. But it was a very big number of tracks, right? It was only 1.5 million of those tracks. I say only, because that's still a very big number, but it's a small percentage yeah. of the total that achieved in, in a year that they measured it, a thousand streams or more. So it was actually still very concentrated. I mean, if we if we take a thousand as being, which is actually a very small number, um, as being well, that's kind of successful streaming, right? Because it was a thousand plus, well, right? Are, yeah. um, <coughs> um, then then it was actually a very small group of tracks mm -hmm. um, that achieved that, and I'm assuming that th that means an even smaller group of artists, right? So, so definitely there's dilution in this area, there's hyper competition, not denying that, but I think it's a, a little, perhaps, you know, there needs a to be a little, little bit overblown. of balance. overblown, but we need it's more context. Not, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it overblown. There is a, a genuine, huge increase and flood of content, well, absolutely. And there's a but how much of it actually gets streamed? Right, that's and what I was th just saying. I mean, how many are sitting at zero plays? Like right. 30%, well, right? Well, I think it was 30% in that study or uh, so, it, some well such it number. Just came out, it just came out of like a couple weeks ago, 38 million songs that are sitting in uh, in uh, platforms have never been, been surfaced streamed, right. once. Not even by the artist's mother or the artist <laughs> themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so or by the AI. <laughs> or by but, the AI. But going back to Sam's text or tweet, the um, and I agree with what it says, and I'm going to come back around to this. The 
distinction in my mind is that not a lot has changed. So like, it's the fans who have become the artists today. It's the fans who became the artists in 1993, and it's the fans who became the artists in 1963. And you can take it back to the beginning of modern music. The difference garage is, bands. is, huh? Garage bands. I mean, yeah, garage bands, bands that you know had label deals that you've never heard sure, of. Sure. I don't know how many copyrights are in the U in the United States Copyright Office, but I'm sure it's hundreds of millions, and nobody's ever mm -hmm. heard of. Yeah. The the distinction is is that the that the barriers to entry are way lower, right? Like, so in 1963, you had to be a musician. You had to be a singer. You had to have some kind of um, musical capability. In 1993, that was a little bit different. You could be a programmer. You could know how to use an MPC. You could make music in a different way. Mm -hmm. Today, you don't have to know any of that. You can just make music. Mm -hmm. And that's the key distinction of the, of the evolution in my mind. And the thing that happens is that, yes, you do get a lot of garbage out there but when you start to see sort of the trends on TikTok and Instagram as well, and you can kind of combine them against um, so, um, Shazam and other sort of data sets, and you'll see a cream mm -hmm. that's rising to the top. And that is what's driving not only the revenue for the DSPs, but the revenue for recorded music. So quality yeah. still matters. Well, and motivation, which is the other thing, is that I oftentimes think about the, the artists as a pyramid. And there's about 3% of artists at the top, superstar global artists. They're making a lot of money. They're getting on playlists, hundreds and hundreds of millions of streams across all platforms, household names. Then at the bottom, there's about 40% of all of the artists who are I would what I would call hobbyists. They have jobs. They're doing this on the weekend. They have no ambition of you know, putting the time and effort into their music to try to make a career out of it. They're probably not touring. They're probably not ever playing live. It's just something that they want to express themselves. And then there's this middle layer of artists who are either kind of r emerging artists on major labels or they're established artists on independent labels. Um, there may be some independent artists who are truly DIY in that mix, but they are trying to make a living and they're trying to be professional musicians. And it's really that layer that this volume-based streaming economy that we have now, it doesn't work for them. Because if you're not really getting hundreds of millions of streams and you don't get placed on playlists, you know, in the olden days, if somebody could buy CDs after your show and, you know, maybe, you know, you do a small tour, Yes, and that is, that is kind of making a comeback. Um, but I think we have these different segments of artists who have different motivations mm -hmm. for it. And then in addition to these, this pyramid of artists who are distributed, there was a really fascinating media study done about a year ago, and they discovered there are about 20 million artists who are creators, but they fall completely outside of our ecosystem right now. They don't distribute their music into DSPs. Mm. They may upload to SoundCloud or maybe Instagram or they're creating, but they are not in any kind of um, system mm. of our industry that we have now. And I think that's another really interesting group where they want to express themselves, but they probably feel like I don't want to sign up for a PRO. Why would I do that? It's too complicated. Mm. It's too complicated. <laughs> I'm probably not going to make any money. Maybe someone will discover my song on SoundCloud and I'll get picked up and I'll, b I'll hit it big and I'll figure it out then. Okay, the moment we've all been waiting for. Let's talk AI. So talk about a massively like disrupting force. Uh, AI is poised to disrupt literally everything, everything about music, every facet of music creation from like instrumental composing, to singing, to image and likeness, uh, to songwriting, certainly. Um, I want to show you guys a brief video example uh, from BandLab. They have a product called Song, Star Song Starter that is an AI musical igen idea generator. And hopefully we will get it to work. It's on my last slide. And if not, we're going to move on. Nope, maybe not. <laughs> 
possibly. <laughs> I thought we were living in the future. Just kidding. <laughs> Just when you need AI. All right. You know what? We're going to move on. If, uh, if we can get it to work, we'll pause. No worries. Um, so just last month, the Human Artistry Campaign launched. This was at South By last month. It's a coalition of over 40 parties uh, that represent rights holders. Uh, my organization, the Recording Academy, the RIAA, SAG-AFTRA, uh, Sound Exchange, many others were involved. They set out seven core principles for AI applications aimed at supporting human artistry. And so among those are that the use of copyrighted works and the use of the voices and likenesses of professional performers requires authorization, licensing, and compliance with all relevant state and federal laws. Big words. Many of the organizations represented on this very panel, CSAC, Recording Academy, we've been really outspoken about the concern surrounding AI training itself on popular music to pump out music that mimics existing artists and works. As a staunch defender of artist rights and fair pay, Sam, what needs to happen for the music industry to peacefully coexist with AI? Is it even possible? I, I mean, anything's possible, but I think it begins with uh, embracing it and knowing how to manage it rather than having it manage you. And that's a, um, you know, I am definitely a so be aging. proactive instead be of reactive. Completely. Unlike and 20 years ago, right? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly where I was going. I used to go into these CEOs' offices, and they had these massive boxes with screens, and they didn't really use them. They didn't know that it was going to become the world, right? And they ignored Napster. But it disrupted the business for 20 years. Um, now it's doing great again, but, you know, it's because of that invention. So this is that same opportunity. And if songwriters, uh, artists, but all of these organizations, and I think it's more than doubled in the past two weeks, so it's now like 90 organizations have oh signed wow. on. Mm -hmm. And it's not just music, it's sports teams, like uh, the NFL Players Association. I don't think the NBA or the NBA Players Association has signed on, uh, Major League Baseball Players Association has signed on. So there's anything where there's sort of name, likeness, copyright involved, it's super important that we are either on the cutting edge or ahead of the cutting edge in order to make it something that helps us, makes our business more impactful rather than lets it go away. So kind of the first step is, it sounds like protective legislation is kind of the first step. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge part it's of it. The but step we should be doing right now. But it's also <laughs> learning how to work with it. Yeah. Well, exactly, because I also I also think, you know, I 100% uh, agree that we can't allow AI engines to be trained on commercial recordings only to then cannibalize and print. And monetize. And mo print out and monetize cheap versions of artist songs. I think that that, I think there's going to be litigation. I think there's going to be a lot of issues in that reign. But I think the range of things that AI can do as an empowering technology are really exciting. And if you think about creator tools, um, you know, many of us were around in the days when the drum machine was created and there were many people who said oh this is the end of drummers there's never going to be another job for drummers drummers are dead there's never going to be a role artists said this is fantastic I can tr I can practice without having to have a drummer I can keep my beat I can you know it's enabling and guess what there are plenty of drummers and um, and I think that you know the tools that will come out of the tools that will come come out of AI for songwriting rhythm melody plugins into DAWs that will enable artists, mm -hmm. and it's an extension of themselves. I think it's a really, really exciting and empowering, uh, an empowering moment. Um, and then I also think there's a zone where are there things that the industry could do collectively to get ahead of it, monetize, license it, and uh, enable some sort of revenue share broadly for labels and publishers whose sound recordings are mixed up in this you know could there be a license model for artists to you know who want to embrace it to feed their sound recordings in sure. and 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 license that 
Um, I think about people like Tom Waits, who've lost the ability, almost lost his voice. You know, could he create an AI of himself and continue to create music and have an artificial version of his voice? Mm -hmm. But these are things that also imply some level of control, but openness and embracing of the tech. So the former head of Google China is a guy named Kai Fu Li. And he wrote sort of the definitive book on AI, and it's called AI Superpowers. There's more words, but I don't remember them. The, um, and the, in that book, he uh, predicts like a 10-year period. And this is in 2018. So we're five years through that 10-year period in which AI will come and take 50% of all jobs. And we're going to start, it was very slow between 2018 and now, but what we're going to start seeing is sort of an exponential uh, growth of AI in our lives. And it's going to start to look a lot more like what's happening in China, whereas there are very few people in China who haven't been um, scanned and they're, they don't, you know, they can define a person by not only how their face looks, but how they walk, the kind of clothes they wear, the patterns that they walk. It's really kind of creepy. And those kinds of things will come more and more into our lives to the extent that art is ahead of it. And you know, the points that you're making were, can we hear a new, um, I don't know, I'm going to say John Denver record or Tom Waits record or any, can, we, can Val Kilmer ne in his next you know, super movie role actually have a speaking uh, capacity? Like there are wonderful things that could come out of this across entertainment, but it's really about making sure we're eyes wide open and harnessing it rather than letting it harness us. Yeah. Danny, what are your thoughts? I agree with all of the panelists, obviously. Um, I do think that it's really important that we think about the ethics around AI, and that in, it is very important for the people that are developing the AIs themselves. So at Band Lab, we're very conscious about maintaining an ethical approach to AI, meaning that all of the material that is fed into SongStarter to train it is not even music that's available in the public domain. It's music that we've commissioned. So, and we don't use any material from our users to train it. It is 100% our own data set that we have created. Yeah. Now, of course, Many other companies do not follow these same rules and are training on commercially available works, and we've seen <laughs> the outcomes of that already. Have, has anybody seen the video of David Guetta, who used Eminem's voice in a set? Yeah. yeah? So that very obviously is just the tip of the iceberg of what we'll see with, sorry? Sorry, what is possible. Oh, what is possible, yeah. yeah. Right. The very tip of the iceberg. Um, so we need to have boundaries, and we need to have boundaries early. But I will also agree with Vicky in that I think it is an inevitability. It is already in our lives. Mm. It's not going away. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. And I think there's immense possibility with people being able to use AI as an arrow in their quiver for when they're making music. Um, their song starter is a great example where it just gives you an idea uh, I, as an artist myself, I can't tell you how many times I have been stuck with blank slate syndrome. Sure. <laughs> so it's really nice to just have something to go off of. Um, so I guess there are pluses and minuses, yeah. and we just need to be ahead of it. Nadir, thoughts on AI? Yeah, I, I mean, fairly consistent with, <laughs> with this group, right? I mean, I think, you know, the challenge is, is how do you protect the artist community, the creative community? It's not just a music issue, right, clearly. So how do you protect them on one side and then enable innovation on the other side? So yeah. it's what Vicky and Danny are saying about like, you know, what's the, what's the new drum machine? What's the new synthesizer? Um, and, and the great work that Band Lab are doing as well, right? So, so you know, there needs to be a kind of a, 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 a strategy that encompasses both, right? Copyright laws on one side, the ability to license. Uh, Danny's used this word that we also agree with, ethical AI. Right, how, how, you know, what, what are the companies that are gonna do that? Um, and, and those companies that, that aren't ethical, you know, what, what happens to those companies? And, you know, there's this Getty Images lawsuit. Um, they filed for what, 1.5 trillion wow. 
Um, and, um, and, you know, I actually looked this up, but the, the UK's GDP is three trillion. So it's like they're claiming half the UK's GDP or equivalent. It's an incredible number, right? And, and they've actually broken down, you know, they've showed the images that are being used. There's even like Getty Images watermarks wow. um, that have been distorted by the AI. So clearly that's that's a thing. Um, and they've, they've, they've said th these many images were used and we want this much. And so, you know, copyright laws are real and they've enabled the creative community for a long time and, and you know, they, they always will. There would, they, there would be no, you know, creative community across music, art, film, everything without, you know, stern copyright laws around the world. And for those who, who aren't familiar with what Nadir is referencing, the Midjourney uh, rep, I think it was the CEO, in an interview openly disclosed that they trained their AI by scraping 100 million images that were on the internet and had absolutely no qualms about it. So I think that's the other bit, is every time there's new technology, there are new technologists who come around, and this has been happening since the earliest days of digital disruption 23 years ago, saying, I don't think copyright laws apply anymore. I don't think, I don't think that, you know, and I, and I talked to all these Web3 companies when that was blowing up, saying, we've looked at that and we just feel like we're in a post-copyright world. <laughs> and, and so there's also, I think, this, you know, this rebalancing and settling that, no, yeah. there are okay. laws and, and copyright practices around the world that do apply. Just, just to sort of finish that off, I mean, the, the EU um, today stated very clearly that they want regulation and legislation, but they were very clear that it starts with protecting copyright laws, right? And the EU is, you know, whatever you think of them, right? They're very, they're very progressive about this type of thing. They're usually on the bleeding edge of it. Right, absolutely. 